Hello and welcome to uh, our conversation today on powering European, powering up European high tech. My name is Ravi Mati. I'm the technology editor at the Financial Times, and I'm very pleased to be joined here with a, a very impressive panel of leading thinkers and, crucially, doers. Um, before I start to introduce all of them, um, let me just do a couple of housekeeping notes. Just to emphasize, please do turn off your phones and put them onto silent. I'd be grateful. This is an on-the-record discussion, and obviously you can tweet. There is a hashtag MIGlobal up there to do so. Um, and just to give you a little bit of context of what we're talking about, um, at the FT, obviously, uh, one of the big topics we talk about is technology and how it's changing the worlds of business, policy, everything, basically. Um, and one of the big narratives of recent years, uh, I would say, is the rise or emergence of a European or a stronger European presence in the technology world. Um, you see it in the increased amounts of venture capital funding, uh, increased amounts of startups, and perhaps a change of attitude as well. To give a sense of that change of attitude, uh, I wanted to give you just a, a brief example of a company uh, called Blippar. So Blippar is a London-based augmented reality company. And after about three years of existence, uh, the founder was called by a company who won't tell us who it is from California and told, why don't you come across and we'll have a chat about buying you for one and a half billion dollars. Three-year-old company, and this guy was about 23 at the time. He had a quick thought, picked up the phone and said no. Now, that leads me to two conclusions. He's an idiot um, <laughs> or he's a genius. Whatever your perspective, though, I think it reflects a change of ambition, a change of confidence, perhaps, among some of the people who are on the stage with me now, uh, but also in the community they're part of. So to delve into this topic, um, our friends at the Milken Institute have assembled a very impressive panel of people who are right in the mix of all of this. I'm going to just introduce them very quickly. There are extensive bios in the, uh, the app um, and elsewhere. But from, starting from the far right, we have uh, Nick Bray, who's the chief financial officer at Sophos, which is one of the UK's big cybersecurity companies. And earlier this year, uh, they listed an initial public offering on the London Stock Exchange for just over a billion dollars. That's right, Nick? Billion pounds. Billion pounds, sorry. Um, which made it the largest ever uh, UK listing of a technology company. Um, to his left and my right is Graham Cook, who's the co-founder and CEO of Qubit, um, which is a, a data intelligence company that allows e-commerce to happen much more seamlessly. So retailers want to sell stuff, come to them, and understand exactly how to target and use the data that's coming out of that to be much more efficient, much more personalized. Um, Graham, before launching that business, uh, worked for five years at Google, where he ended up as the head of conversion rate optimization, which sounds a bit alien, but I think means helping clients maximize the effectiveness of their websites. Um, and he's an entrepreneur from the age of 18, 13, I'm told. He opened a coffee shop at school after buying an espresso machine. I don't know what kind of teenagers are on espresso, but uh, there you go. Um, to my left, Sarah Murray, who's a serial entrepreneur as well. Um, she's founded a consultancy company um, around uh, marketing effectiveness. Um, she also then later founded the company which became Confused.com, is that right? Um, and now she founded, she's founded and, and run something called Buddy, which provides technology and services that allow you to track uh, the locations and, and remotely track and monitor uh, individuals. Um, to her left is Ricardo Zaccone, who's the co-founder and CEO of King Digital Entertainment, uh, known uh, better perhaps as the company that created the Candy Crush game. Um, he's one of those people who uh, you can uh, credit or blame for masterminding casual games, these really addictive apps that um, become uh, the bane of our existence and the joy of our lives and our commutes home. Um, the company, though, is extremely successful, based here in London, but IPO'd in New York for about uh, $6 billion, which isn't uh, bad. And he's also a noted investor. Among the companies invested in recently is Dubsmash, which is a Berlin-based startup and one of the hottest, hottest social media trends, particularly among that group called Young People. Uh, I would suggest you check it out. And finally, but not least, uh, Fred Desta uh, from Axel Partners is works for one of the, the leading venture capital firms. Uh, Fred has worked here in the States and, and come back 
And some of the companies he's been involved in include Zoopla, which is the property startup, um, and uh, Daily Motion, um, which is the Paris-based uh, video platform. Um, more recently, companies like Deliveroo, which many of you, I'm sure, have used. Now, to kick us off, I'm going to ask each of you experts a, a brief question. Um, and I'm going to go in reverse order from the way I introduced you. So I'm going to start with Fred. We're talking about European tech. Give me a sense. What is, if you were to define the USP of Europe's tech companies and scene, and where does that place Europe vis-a-vis -vis Silicon Valley? All right, so I'm going to start with my usual spiel, which is that we should stop comparing ourselves to the Valley. It's right. a phenomenal vortex. We'll probably never mimic it. We can learn from it. Um, and then European tech is really has no um, singular face. I mean, it's a set of clusters that each bring their own um, their own specialisms and their own beauty. And you know, whether it's fintech in London or uh, e-commerce in Berlin, you know, it really innovation springs from everywhere. Um, so I think what's happened in the last few years in Europe is we've unleashed our ambition. We stopped uh, doing incrementalism and we started building companies that really try and go and build global leaders, whether it's a delivery hero or supercell or a king. And I think we have nothing to be ashamed of. We got a bunch of $5 billion companies coming up the ranks and people who say no to one and a half billion dollar exits. So I think we should be very proud of our ecosystem and just learn from the Bay instead of trying to mimic it. And Ricardo. Well, I mean, <clears throat> first of all, I'm not sure if it was a wise decision to refuse $1.5 billion offer. <laughs> That's something which I think is very much also on the terms. Uh, I think the key difference between us and the Valley is time. I think that they started much earlier than we did. I think that it takes a long time before you have the, uh, the ecosystem working. Ecosystem meaning entrepreneurs, successful, uh, make money, invest in other entrepreneurs because that's what they know best. And then you have the second, the second line of entrepreneurs from there and they also start their new, their new companies. Silicon Valley has been around for a very long time and this, they have had this ecosystem working for some time. And so I think Today, the key differences are, uh, well, now there's a lot of capital available also in, in Europe. Uh, I would say, argue maybe possibly even too much. Uh, I think that one of the advantages of Europe is in mobile. I think we have a mobile culture. 3G, 4G started in Europe before it was in the US, before it was big there. I think we have an advantage in terms of scalability. Think uh, of if I'm in, in the UK, the UK market is actually too small. Uh, that was always an advantage to be in the US. The US market is many times bigger, but now with mobile and platforms like Facebook, Google, and Apple, you can immediately have your, your software or your apps available globally. And so this takes away the advantage of being in a bigger market. And I think Europeans are learning slowly to launch immediately many markets, not just in one market, in one language. And this gives us also size. Uh, uh, and then I think the other difference possibly today between Silicon Valley and Europe uh, I think is the, uh, is the mindset. I think in the Valley, it doesn't really matter if you make money or not, you're focused first of all on reach. I think in Europe, since we have a bit more, uh, a bit earlier in the, in, the, in the process, I think, we are focused also on making money. At least definitely it was our approach. We had to become profitable very fast and then think uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that you can scale. Making money is a good thing, I think, if you're a business. Um, Sorry? <laughs> making money is a good thing if you're a business, probably. Sarah. Yeah. Well, I think Ricardo has covered quite a lot of points there. Um, I think there are two really important things for starting a company in Europe. The first is that we, um, we have to struggle from the beginning. And one of the things that an investor looks for in a business is a management team that can cope with an issue. So it hits a barrier, it can cope with it, it can get over it. And one advantage that US companies have in starting up is they, they don't face those barriers, or, or certainly not so quickly. Um, so that struggle and the climbing over that barrier means that the companies that do survive in Europe are better companies, in my view. And the second is something that Ricardo touched on, which is um, our, our understanding now and our access to world markets as opposed to the home market. Um, so historically, it was very difficult to export and to grow overseas, and therefore having a small UK market was a real constraint. Whereas now, as we're, we're all operating in world markets, we know as, as 
certainly as a Brit, uh, I know that entering a new market means meeting new cultures, new way of doing business, new business models, and having to work out how it's going to work in those markets. I haven't had the advantage of a large home market where I've, I've learned to expect that everyone does business in the same way I do, and therefore I can access, access those world markets with that expectation and, and therefore hopefully do better in them. Graham. I think we have some advantages. Um, if you look at the consumer, uh, the European consumer is the most digitally savvy per capita uh, than, than anywhere else in the world, in particular the UK. We see an e-commerce spend per capita here in London that's the highest in the whole world. 55% of digital media or of media is spent digitally in the UK. And that's far more than the US. So I think we have an advantage in that part by understanding a more advanced consumer, um, which enables businesses that start here to cater for a more demanding, more advanced digitally, uh, digital consumer. So I think that's a big advantage here of being a, a UK-based company in particular. Um, I think the second is really around an understanding of internationalization and localization and you know, being able to uh, immediately know that your product, your technology, needs to be globally distributed and looking to the US as an exciting market, but also looking to Europe as a, as a, on our doorstep as an exciting market, means that you're driving that in your product innovation from a very early point in time, while the US companies don't really think about moving out of the US until you know, pretty much a year before IPO. So I think those are really two big advantages that we have here in Europe. Well, I know. Yeah, well, I think as you, as you were saying, Ricardo, on, time is one thing. I think what that leads to is that it's getting much better, but. You know, that belief and confidence of, of the European tech scene just to really kind of go for it. And again, you, you talked about the example of somebody rejecting a one and a half billion dollar offer. I mean, I think that's not the norm right here, right now in Europe, whereas where that probably is the norm in, in the US. And it, but as we were saying, if you, if you look at you know, that, those US companies, they have seen exactly the same where typically they'll focus on the US and there's just massive potential in emerging markets, India and other areas. And again, just because of where we're strategically placed. You know, I think, I think it's, a, it's a real strength of Europe. So I think all the building blocks are there. Again, it's just that bit of, bit of confidence, bit of time, the green shoots are coming, and the belief that people can do it. Let's delve into a bit more of your, your stories as, as business people and founders. Ricardo, if I start with you, you obviously chose to list in the States. Can you give us an ex some sense of why you chose to do it there rather than here as, as Nick's done now? I mean, obviously, there's a time gap between the two listings. But what did, what did the U.S. in that context offer you um, that was particularly attractive? First of all, when you list, I haven't listed many companies, so I listed <laughs> this is the first company I list. So you rely a lot on the experience of people who actually have done it many times. So at the time when we listed, uh, the biggest market, and still today, is the U.S. for us. So most 50% of our consumers are in the U.S. So this is, I think, the first key reason. The second one in tech, our listing was a quite a large float uh, in terms of market cap. I think the, uh, if you look at the current investor base we have, I would say most of our investors are also in the US. So our clients, from an investment point of view, are in the US. Um, so having a product which is well known in the US, where the market, where our biggest market is in the US, and where most investors are in the US, I think made it a very clear case. Now, by contrast, Nick, you, you, you've mentioned with Sophos, that was one of the, by contrast, one of the reasons you chose to listen in the UK. Yeah, but just again, but I, I imagine that the facts are different. I mean, you, Ricardo, you know, majority of your customers are in the US. I mean, yeah. we've you know we've got a substantial base of customers in the US, about a third of our business. But again, Europe is fifty four percent of all of our. You know, so that's the history and heritage of the company. And, and and we were asked this question a lot actually when we when we floated why you know why the UK. And I'd say well why not? You know we're we're a UK headquartered global company, approaching half a billion, hundred million of profits. You know, really good growth. Last year we grew at 17%. And with all the kind of metrics, those are just the right sort of metrics that UK investors in the UK market like. So for us, it was just a, it was just a natural <coughs> thing to do based on our history, heritage, where our people are, where our IP is, and again, where, where our brand, you know, where, where our brand is better known. So it just again, it just made natural sense for Sophos to come to the UK. Can I just yes, add yes. to that? Um, so you're touching on a key point here. So in the UK, if you're a really profitable, 15 to 25 percent grower the market will love you and yeah. please have a dividend yield. If you're trying to float, so I'll take the example of Zoopla, right? So Zoopla has 100 million pounds in revenue, whatever it is, 15 to 20% growth. Perfect for the UK market. So free cash flow stock, people love it. If you're trying to float Zillow, which is the US equivalent, which was a loss-making 70% fast grower, 
there, there's no way you could have floated it in the, in the UK. However, the valuation they got and the belief of institutional investors to say, we can get over the hump of lack of profitability, yeah. mean that the market cap was spectacular. And I think that we still see that the institutional investment groups in the UK are very much, you know, uh, steady growth, high profitability, high cash flow, dividend yield kind of guys. And you know, it's actually hurting some of our companies because sometimes we do want access to capital early on things that are growing like that, but where we have to sell the story forward. And I don't think the public markets are particularly receptive to that in the UK. No, and I, you know, I, I mean, I completely agree. If, if, if you look at that, that, that typical, a two, typical US tech float is very high growth, you know, losing money, burning cash. But, but that's, that's, you know, in, US investors are prepared to take that risk. You know, but as you rightly say, I mean, for, I mean, for a company like ourselves, Sophos, with our financial profile, it just made complete sense. And by the way, you know, we did put a dividend there. But again, that tick box exercise, because that's sort of what Europe expects, which is a bit strange for a high tech company, but it was just part of the, part of the process. Okay. But, but I think really, if you, if you are really a high growth early stage, you're the, you're the Uber type company or the Twitter or something like that, again, I think naturally you would, you would be more inclined to the US because even though UK investors get technology, they're still a bit more traditional in terms of financially what they're looking for as opposed to that, that higher growth, higher risk profile. And, that, and that's where US tech investors play. Sir, can I come to you? Because one of the things we've talked about a lot that a few people have talked about is this idea of time and changing the nature of the development of the ecosystem, development of change of attitude and approach. As someone who's founded an, a succession of companies, you've probably seen this at the front line and, and seen it change over that time. Can you give us a sense of what you've seen evolve? Are there tangible things that you've seen which maybe give you more optimism about where we are now than where we were, say, when you started your first company in the 90s? Um, yeah, so the first and mo most obvious thing is when I started my first business more than 20 years ago, if, I, if someone asked me what I did and I said I was an entrepreneur, there would be a sort of blank look, oh, you couldn't get a job then. <laughs> um, although I, I joke, but it's sort of true. My mother's still expecting me to get a real job at some point. Um, whereas now, kind of everyone wants to be an entrepreneur and everyone recognises it. Um, again, 20-odd years ago, the only place you could really get money was the bank, who said, well, have you got a house that we can take in, in lieu of that, the money we're going to provide you? <coughs> or the Prince's Trust, which would give you £2,500 to start a business, but it was six months of form filling, and that was basically it. So if you were starting a business, it, you didn't even contemplate raising money. You, you had to get a customer to pay you. So, and that's what I did when I started my first business. I built the user interface of some software, and I put a button on that said Optimize, and I did the, back, the, the behind so that when you press Optimize, it changed the numbers, but it wasn't actually really working. Um, and I went and presented it to the chairman of Smith Gun Beecham and said, look, I can optimize your Salesforce strategy. And he should, said, show me. And I pressed the optimize button and the numbers changed and obviously improved. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh, that's great. Let's try it. So um, I then went off and rapidly built this software while working on my first customer. And then it worked. So it kind of went from there. Whereas nowadays, you'd go along, you'd present to VCs and they'd probably invest in you. So wholly different. But I have to say, I, I do concur with what other people have been saying about the difference between raising money in the UK and the US. So I, I have two issues on that. One is that uh, we do hardware. So, you know, this is Buddy. Um, and in the US, they say, wow, that's amazing. It's so, it's so small. How can, you, how can you do what you're doing in such a little device? And it looks great. In the UK, they say, oh, it's hardware. We want to invest in software platforms. <laughs> OK, fine. So we can't really raise money here. Um, and the other is, you know, talking to the likes of investors that we've been talking to, if we were to potentially IPO, um, they say, oh, no, your growth is too high. 100% growth, we can't, uh, we can't, you can't mm. IPO yet, because you need to be able to know what your numbers are next year before you can IPO. So they're actually waiting for you to, to stop being so successful before you can IPO in the UK, which is rather extraordinary. So, but then why have, have you looked at, say, going to the US and doing it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bit early for us. Right. So f f for us to have those conversations here makes sense because we know the guys right. and they're around the corner. But to actually make an effort to go over to the US and start having those conversations would create some noise, right. which we're not quite ready to do. Fred, Fred, can I ask you the same question to Sarah? Because obviously you were here in, in, in Europe, went to the US and came back. And we talk, spoke earlier about some of the shift, um, some of the, the attitude, the ambition. What are the tangible things you've seen that coming back, uh, you noted Europe because you've talked, spoken about Europe, uh, to, to me, is, uh, is one of the greatest opportunities to invest anywhere because the, the potential is, is huge. And 
there's less people investing here, presumably, than, than in the States. Give us a sense of tangibly what's changed over that period of time. Um, yeah, I mean, I have, we have some practical examples in, in our portfolio that are quite staggering. So if you look at BlaBlaCar, which is a sort of alternative transportation yeah. network, here's a bunch of Paris guys who, the moment it worked in France, uh, decided to say, you know what, we're going to centralize analytics and operations in Paris, which is probably exactly what King does in, in Stockholm and London. And we're going to throw this thing open and go in every market that we can in parallel. Um, and, you know, they're now number one in Germany, Spain, and pretty much every European country. And we're doing exactly the same right now with Deliveroo. And so what you have is, you know, you have this ability to manage centrally a very tight, high operating leverage kind of technology operation that's world class. And then it becomes a question of access to capital and can you scale it in parallel. So in the case of Deliveroo, you know, we raised 25, then we raised 70, and we're basically going to 23 cities internationally all at once. And we're not doing it because we're crazy. We're doing it because we hired the guy who used to run a group on Northern Europe to run international, and the guy's got a playbook. So this is just a rollout, and you know if we're we're fighting the Samur, so I'm going to use the Samur word. We're doing blitzkrieg against you know against the Samur Empire to try and show that we can take ownership everywhere. We'd never have done that five years ago. We would have gone to Germany and tested Hamburg. Now we're going to Paris, Paris Madrid, Dublin, you know Berlin, Hamburg, Munich, boom. Right, yeah, and, think, uh, and, and this is possible due to access to capital, depth of talent in the management teams, and just ambition. And just to explain, Deliveroo is one of these food delivery companies, so you call up a restaurant, they'll do the delivery for companies that don't have delivery services like Marcus Please, please try it. <laughs> yeah, you should try it. And the Samwares is uh, run a company called Rock Internet in Germany, uh, which calls itself a kind of incubator of high-tech startups. And Fred's gonna take him down. Um, <laughs> Graham, uh, one of the things that I find interesting, so we, we're presenting Europe in very glowing terms, but one of the things you mentioned earlier, I should explain, you're an American and a Brit, um, and one of the things you said was that actually expanding to the US was easier from the UK than expanding from the UK to France. Mm -hmm. So can you just pour a little bit of cold water on this? Where, where Europe, if we talk about Europe as an entity, I mean, Fred alluded to the maybe that's the wrong way of framing it, that mm. actually there are pockets, you know, Berlin, mm. Stockholm, Paris to some extent, London. Give us a sense where that sits in, in that conversation. Yeah, I mean, we're, I mean, we're an enterprise software as a service company. And in terms of where our, cu our customer base is, you know, the largest retailers and travel companies in the world. So we're working with, you know, the Emirates and Staples to Jimmy Choo. And we found that our competitors were not in Europe. We didn't have any competitors in Europe. We had American companies that were doing that we were competing with that were in Europe, but they were not originated from European companies. So when we looked at where's the next biggest market for us to go, we found that that was the US, and it was the same competitors that we'd grown up with here in the UK for the last couple of years. So we thought that it would, it would be, you know, we, we wanted sort of access to a market that's four to five times bigger, that does speak English, that does look for enterprise software as a service, and we knew the playbook against these competitors. And we've grown, you know, 750% in the last year by following that strategy to go into America. Um, at the same time, we have launched in, in some markets in Europe, and it's just, it, it, it is a more complicated process. There, there's sort of a, a different buying culture to enterprise software in Europe, which is more around, well, I need to know you, I need to try it out, I need to, you know, does my friend use you? And it takes longer to seed it. So the US was, yeah, we'll try it, this sounds good, boom, explosive growth. Yeah. And Europe has been more about, let's, let's sort of suck it and see. So our strategy in Europe has had to be a bit more about um, actually going after a couple of anchor clients that everybody looks up to working with them, and then expanding each market around that, rather than everybody was willing to try the software in the state. So it's interesting because when we looked at starting up the business, we were saying, you know, are we better off starting this business in the US, or are we better off starting this business in, in the UK? I was in London. My co-founder, Emre, at Google was in New York. And uh, we decided to start in London because we thought the competitive advantage was to build an engineering team here in London because there, were, there, were, you know, there was less of a competitive environment for hiring and growing engineering teams. And that was absolutely the case. You know, we've managed to grow to an engineering team of 55, very loyal, 
low churn rate, happy engineers. If we were doing this in the Valley, we would have already probably churned about 50% of the team and spent three times as much money. So there was a competitive advantage to running the business here and scaling to America next. Yeah. Well, I could say we've, mm. we've seen exactly the same in that, in that our core engineering teams are based, you know, here in the UK mm. and, and essentially here in the UK, Germany, Hungary, and, and in, now India with about 600 mm. people engineers in India. But in terms of market receptivity, exactly right. It's exactly what we've seen in the US. So, so our, our latest cloud product, you know, mm. cl cl cloud in the US, <clears throat> you, know, you know, seriously taking off. Whereas again, you look to you look to France, you look to Germany, you've got all these regulation issues, and you've got nervousness around yeah. just cloud open data. So, so there, are, there are issues around that. <clears throat> where just, just the U.S. market, again, it, it's, it, it's far more open. It's, it's out, outside of language, just less regulation, less nervousness mm. about pushing ahead with some of the more the newer cloud technologies. Exactly. Can, can I make an additional point on that? So Please. there are two things that are important in what you said. The number one is you have to go where your strongest competition is. And mm. these days, European companies are okay to go mm. and attack the U.S. Uh, leaders head on. It's true for ClickView. It's true for Qubit. But the second thing is, in the U.S., and this is a real impediment in Europe, in the U.S., corporations have understood that embracing innovation is key to their future. Mm -hmm. And so the large corporates, you know, they champion the adoption of early products, yeah. even when they're slightly unformed, and they're willing to make bets on it because they understand it might be transformational to how they run. Exactly. Whereas in Europe, oh my God, you know, the, you, everybody's afraid of losing their job if they huh. make the wrong yeah. technology choice. And so that's why we always end up bringing all the enterprise software companies whether it's you guys or Forge mm -hmm. Rock or ClickView, always end up going to the US because they're, you know, they're championing the transformation of industry. Whereas in Europe, <coughs> everybody's resisting the transformation of industry. Is and that, that's a real issue. Is yeah. that changing? To what extent is that changing? Is that mindset? Slowly. It slowly. is slowly. It is, slowly? it is slowly changing. I mean, that's what we're that's our European strategy now, is we're going we're in, we're, change, we're going into markets where we actually have a methodology to identify disruptor businesses. And, and we find, we, we use this technique on, I'm not going to give all the secrets away, but we, we use this technique where we can look on LinkedIn and we can make an assessment of the person we're selling to is actually a person who embraces change or fears change. And we won't sell to businesses where we have a high score of someone who fears change, i.e. they've been in the same job for 10 years, never changed, never promoted. So we actually identify these people in all these different markets and we go in for those people and then we, we build our anchor customers and then we look more established in those markets. And that, that blueprint is the approach you have to take in, a, in Europe. And I, I don't think American companies can think like that yet because they just don't know the nuances of, of the European culture like somebody based in the UK does. So I think being a UK based company has the advantage of the US and also a better understanding of Europe. So I think it, we do have an advantage being here. Right, so I need to go game my LinkedIn profile. Yeah. Change <laughs> uh, Ricardo, both, as I said, you're, you're both a kind of someone who runs a company, fund, but also someone who is invested and has a, you know, you're very present in the European scene, as it were. Um, in terms of the founders that you're dealing with, the Dub Smash guys, for instance, and where they sit versus, say, where you were when you were starting your company, have you seen a tangible change in their approach and their attitude, their mindset? Is it simply the, the global ambition which has changed massively? I actually don't know them well. So from that point of view, I cannot okay, right. talk about them. <laughs> okay. um, what I do basically is I, and I think many entrepreneurs do the same, when you make some money, you put the money where you trust. And since I don't understand well banks, I don't trust them as much as entrepreneurs. Uh, and also in terms of upside, what I do is I put rather money with entrepreneurs. I think it's important to give back. If I look at all the money I ever made, or sorry, all the money I ever got, first of all, the most precious money I ever got for the success of King was the money from angels. Because without, we were almost about to go bust for a couple of hours, and if we had not gotten 500,000 euros, we would not be here. And we took the company to profitability, I think, with 700,000 euros uh, after a year and a half. So that money was the most important. And so I think that what I'm doing now is I'm investing super early, as an angel in, in uh, and now we have set up with the other King founders also an angel fund to do that. And it's partially giving back. I never count to make money. For me, this money is lost. And I don't tell them what they should do. I give them the money. You do what you want with it. Hopefully, it's helpful. And uh, if, you need, if you need help, I'm always available. And I'm trying to introduce you to Apple, Google, or Facebook if that is, if that is of help. Or I, you, know, we, you can talk to our tech guys to help you, you know, in terms of scaling and so on. Now, you also mentioned uh, the Apple and Google. And in your earlier answer, you talked about kind of you know, Facebook, Apple, Google, and the influence of those. One of the things that maybe is um, 
not quite right in the way this question is framed is that actually it's oppositional, as Fred mentions, whereas actually maybe it's more about the integration. So even if you're a London-based company, actually you're a global company or a well, tech firm. I slightly that... disagree, sorry, with what was said before, meaning I think where you scale depends, from my point of view, only one, from one thing. I think that if you have a product that is different from others, then this product will be successful. If it's successful in one country, usually it's successful in, in all countries, with the, in brackets the exception possibly of some Asian countries which, which have some more localization requirements. So this is my experience after three companies. I've seen everywhere the same working in all the countries. So if you do that, then we believe in product. So if the product is different, innovative, and has value added for the user, then it's only a marketing exercise. And marketing is easy if the product is new and is better. And you can occupy, you can create your space. So where do you expand? You expand where your product is new. So if there is someone else doing the same or a similar product in the US, why would you go and fight against corporations? That's the last thing I would do. So if you look at the Samberg guys, they take always ideas which are proven, copy the ideas very fast in all markets where these ideas are not spread yet. If you have a great idea and it's new in the UK, where do you go? Do you go first to Germany? No, you go first to the US because that's the biggest market. So that's where I would focus on. If your idea is not new or is new but not so differentiated, then I would spread first to Europe where the others are not. And you can play your localization game very fast. Fred, did you have yeah, so there is a difference between if you're building an, an, a predictive analytics company, mm -hmm. the battle today is always won in the US because that's where the big boys are. That's where you basically want to irk the big guys on their core accounts if you're going to count. Now, if you're building, so I know Roland from, from Dub Smash, which is a very good example to emphasize what, um, what Ricardo just said. Primacy of product used to be a US specialty, right? So the ability to design absolutely awesome user interfaces, used to, even though we have a great design culture in Europe, used to not translate well into tech companies, but that's completely changed. So Roland at Dub Smash and his team are guys who've obsessed about every feature, they've learned from the best in America, they've tested, they've iterated, they launched in multiple app stores, and boom, they get a global success on their hands. Same for King, same for Supercell. And so these boundaries don't matter anymore if you're doing consumer apps uh, typically and you're able to, to really believe in the power of design and to optimize these extremely simple and elegant uh, user experiences and then you can, you can let these companies shine on a global basis. Um, so, um, and I think, I think Europe again has unshackled itself in terms of thinking globally from day one. If you talk to Roland, he's a 24 year old Berlin guy. He doesn't think like a Berlin guy, he thinks global. Mm -hmm. You know, he thinks about your Korean teenagers and American teenagers. Because guess what, they all want to share a video and you know, that's what he does. Yeah. Okay, can I add one more thing? I think we managed to grow and be where we are because we say we grew on the back of giants. So giants are Apple, Facebook, Google. Yeah. Now I think the biggest risk for Europe is actually to oppose these giants, to actually block them so that they, you know, if you are in Europe, actually you have many local laws, and then you, if you want to integrate with Facebook, Google, or Apple, then uh, you have to have additional requirements, which actually the U.S. guys don't have. Because then in the U.S., all the companies can grow very fast and then can integrate you, giving the best possible user experience, while here you can't. So that's, I think, the biggest potential risk, where regulators can do something good, but potentially also create some uh, big problems for local companies to grow uh, globally. Sir, on the hardware side, because you said hardware is a bit trickier to raise money. I mean, are you, would you echo exactly what these guys are saying in terms of uh, both the European advantage and also kind of when you started, buddy, were you immediately thinking global, even though you're based here? Um, I was thinking global and um, I would mostly echo. Um, we're in slightly different markets. So in uh, a large part of our business is criminal justice and the remainder is health. In the criminal justice market, it's much, much easier for us to... Just explain exactly how it works in the criminal justice Right, so, um, so we're putting uh, wearable devices on people to see where they are and how they are. So in health, how they are. In criminal justice, where they are. Um, people are let out. <laughs> people... <laughs> so, so you're allowed to say that, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so the thing we have that's very different from anyone else's devices is the majority of our customers don't want to be wearing them. So they, <laughs> they spend the majority of their time working out how to break it without you noticing. Um, but actually for us to sell in the US is much easier than us, for us to sell in the UK. I mean, it's been all over the press here, the issues we had selling to the government in the UK. 
Um, but if we walk into the US, uh, there is a process for uh, evaluating new technology and for pushing it out across the American market. So that's great. Um, but from our point of view, we, we are, we're a world company. We don't think about markets. Um, we certainly don't consider Europe a single market. So I wouldn't consider Europe versus America because mm. there is no such thing, Europe. We are, it's UK or France or Germany or whatever. So, so you know, my next push is into Indonesia. It's 250 million people. Um, a lot of those probably should be wearing our devices, <laughs> and I would encourage that. Why well, they are they but, are criminals? <laughs> and, but to do that, <laughs> no. But but you know, there is a percentage in every population. Right. So, a country with a large population, then there is most likely a need. Um, but for us. Uh, to sell on the criminal justice side, that would be one customer we'd have to get in a very large market. So that's an obvious place for us to look. Actually, being British really works for us in those markets because our biggest competitor is 3M. They're obviously quite big, um, but their technology is made in Israel. Um, and so it's that not welcomed in those particular markets. Right. Um, and also, there is generally a view around the world that British technology is good that something that comes out of the UK is well, <coughs> well built. Uh, we manufacture here, we design here. So, um, so people have an immediate feeling that that is a positive thing, and that's very helpful to us, particularly in Commonwealth countries. Fred, did you, I don't know, did you want to jump in? No, you didn't. Oh, no, I'm fine. I, you're wearing the health version of the I'm wearing the health one. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, before we throw it out for some questions, because there's lots of smart people in the audience, so I'm sure have, have questions to raise for you. Can I quickly just go again, asking you if you could change anything about the European context, or the British context, or if there was something very tangible that if you had a magic wand, you might be able to, to change or fix, what would it be? Nick, is there anything? Do you know, I mean, I mean there's, there's nothing that really springs to mind, again, other than, other than belief, other than, and again, just, just, just people, local, and I think it is changing, people generally believing that, that it can work. And I, and I think, think, again, one of the advantages of being in Europe is that, again, you know, whether it's ourselves or others, because a lot of the tech is in the U.S., I and mean, actually you can act as a magnet for attracting talent, attracting acquisitions. Again, you know, the U.S. U.S. companies don't typically like you know pushing out overseas. They certainly don't like acquiring overseas typically. So, so again, I, th I think if you really get moving in in Europe as we are, and you know, and King and, and many others, I think you can form a really good platform. So I don't think there's anything one specific. It's just ambition and confidence and belief that you can do it. Right. I have two actually. So the first one is around. I'm, I'm, I'm constantly worried about regulation. I think regulation is, in the hands of people who don't understand technology is a very dangerous thing. And you know, we work very proactively to educate uh, government about data and privacy. And every digital business generates data about users. And, and, and we, we need to, you know, in the Europe, generally speaking, it's, it's always about guilty until proven innocent. In UK and the US, it's innocent until proven guilty. And the US even has a pretty effective self-regulation. And that's really working. Um, UK is very business friendly and, and looks at it the right way. Europe, on the other hand, is, is taking some very uh, dramatic approaches to, to, uh, to data privacy. And so I think regulators need to really bring in the right people to understand uh, what's going on here with digital and, and data. So that's the first. Um, I think the second is around uh, just in the way we teach engineering or computer science at universities, we teach it in Europe or in the UK, and particularly in a very theoretical way. Um, it's a lot of theory rather than a lot of practice. In American universities, they teach computer science in a very business friendly, how are you going to build your business around what you've learned in, when you've been studying computer science. If we can make it more business friendly, we'd get a lot more entrepreneurial engineers in Europe. Um, and, and I think that would create you know, again, another competitive advantage. So it's a sort of a university education level change that needs to happen. Sir, anything to uh, there are, If I could wave a magic wand, there'd be two things I'd change. Um, one is, it doesn't matter what people say, there is an utter dearth of growth capital here in Europe, um, and that needs fixing. Um, and the second is, I would um, change the rules around intellectual property protection in the US, so that these patent troll companies that exist purely to prevent market, natural market growth and competition um, are dissuaded from doing that. Ricardo. I think I can really endorse what was said before. I think it's very important. I think probably the biggest risk which I see in Europe today is regulators trying to regulate everything. And I, I wish that uh, in particular regulators would work together with companies like tech entrepreneurs in, uh, in Europe 
but also together with the, the, with the platforms, Apple, Google, Facebook, to try to understand what makes sense. And not everything needs to be regulated. You can achieve a lot more faster working together and saying, hey, what do you think about this? And let's, let's, do, let's do it right. And that's, that's what I wish would happen. And I think the UK government is really exemplary in working with the businesses and also in building a bridge with the US, in particular with Silicon Valley. Fred? Yeah, so there are two things that uh, I feel quite passionate about. One is, I would love for less public money to flow into freaking venture capital. I think we would have better firms, better practitioners if the market was left to grow on its own. Uh, I think that distortion helps some people stay in business for longer than they should, and it doesn't help the quality of the overall ecosystem. I never make friends when I make that comment, but I believe in it. Um, the second thing is, is around industrial policy. So if you look at France, France has been funding for a long, long time actually quite a lot of technology, but it's all mid-tech. It's cables and it's nuclear and power plants. And they actually have done almost a very little in the high-tech sector. And then when you, can, when you compare that to cybersecurity in Israel or what the Americans are doing, I mean, it's stunning how much they're actually feeding what is true high-tech. And I think a lot of that money gets wasted because of lobbying and you know, protection of these old um, industrial companies gets funneled into research that's in the wrong areas in places where we can't compete long term. Um, the thing I would say, though, in, in maybe in closing, is we're not waiting for anyone to build the ecosystem. And you're the best, the, the, the most entrepreneurial activity we've seen is since the crisis started. We used to not have a single Spanish company in our portfolio, now we have three. Because you know what the young Spaniards said, nobody's going to give me a job, I'm going to make myself one. And I think in general, our attitude as an ecosystem here is to say, you know, we're not going to wait for anyone, we're just going to go and build it. Um, and, you know, I think fundamentally that's what we should keep doing. Almost done. I'm going to throw out, I can ask questions all day, because this is what I do all the time. It's fun. Um, so any questions in the audience? I'd be grateful. There are mics, I believe. And if you could just let us know who you are. Um, and if there's anyone specific you want to ask a question of, please do address it to them. So gentlemen, first, and that were there. Hi there, Matthew Lamb from GAM, an asset manager. A uh, question for you. People talk about technology and the super cycle of technology that we're currently in. The last super cycle, I guess, that as an asset manager we were invested in it was the commodity super cycle, which went on for 10 plus years and has ended in a fairly aggressive fashion. Where do you think we are in this technology super, super cycle? And what percentage of the way, the way through? Gartner talk about something called a hype cycle and this slope of enlightenment that we're now in in technology, having gone through a supply shakeout in 2000. Uh, are we near the end of this, or are we, are we just at the very beginning? Well, why don't we ask the CFO first? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, t t technology is an you know, incredibly broad term. So if you look at I mean, the area that Sophos is in, of IT security, I think that's just going to continue for, for quite some time. It's the... You know, it's, it's just going to be, a, a, I'm sure, a continual growth in that market as, as you know, the, it, you know con constant evol evolution, if you like, of, you know, we and others have to keep combating what the criminals are doing on the far side. But, but there again, there's, there's other technologies, whatever it may be, so whether it's cable tech or some hardware or other things, that, you know, will go through that life cycle. So I think, I think it very much depends where you are. But in terms of right now, security, analytics, you know, you know, cloud, some of those key areas still are driving phenomenal growth, and I think they will do for quite some time. Yeah, I think we're in I mean, a huge renaissance of technology. I mean, when we looked at the last bust in 2001, it was really very, there was, I think, a sort of 100 million global consumers or even that. Yeah. And, and so there were, you, you couldn't be building these giant e-commerce businesses for 100 million people globally. Now there are literally 3 billion consumers online. And I think everything is digitally enabled now. So it's not so much about this tech boom. It's more like our lives are digitally enabled in everything we do. So this e-commerce industry isn't a 2.5 trillion industry. It's actually, a, it's really more like a 20 trillion dollar industry because even before I go into a store, I'm going to look at my phone about the product I'm looking at in the store. It's digitally influenced. So I think when you, when you talk about the sort of the hype cycles, there are, there, there are many digitally influenced businesses that are at different stages of the cycle, depending on what it is. Obviously cloud, is probably in a, in a slope of, uh, what do you call that, a pro plateau of productivity now. I mean, everybody's using cloud. I think it's beyond the hype, it's out of the trough, it's actually a legitimately yeah. great way of running your business. And so you look at other things that are probably right on the hype cycle now, and you just gotta understand what trend you're gonna follow. I'm not an investor, I'm an entrepreneur, so. Anyone over here? Um, so I'm sure you could 
look at historical data and predict exactly what, what point we are in a, in a hype cycle. But if you, um, if you assume that this hype is created by um, investment in spectacular growth delivering spectacular returns, how long is that spectacular growth going to carry on? And if you look at the movement from effectively PCs, laptops to mobile, and then the markets which that, from which that spectacular growth is coming, look at Nigeria and what's expected to happen in Nigeria over the next three to five years, um, then there's no reason to believe that that spectacular growth is going to die very quickly. I mean, I think, you know, we have, it's like, um, with all humility, it's an age of completely unprecedented opportunity because cloud backends, mobile front end, big data analytics enabled, we've never seen this, right? So we are building on the shoulder of giants and it is an incredible era, which is why you see these companies that have completely non-linear valuation growth. They're worth 100, they're worth a billion, they're worth 10 billion, everybody's shaking their head. And actually it's quite rational, they're capturing markets super fast. So you have that underlying trend and it's very deep. At the same time, you know, the markets are irrational uh, and we are seeing late stage investors who do stuff at the speed of light, uh, you know, competing quite irrationally, I think, over certain companies and pricing them well ahead of where they are. So you sort of have to separate and very difficult as an asset manager, I guess, that you have to separate what is irrational market behavior, are we pricing the wrong asset, and these companies that are gonna keep on growing like that and will generate immense amounts of value. So I think on balance, I'm seeing that this is a giant era of continued opportunity, but I'm concerned that the behavioral finance part of me is very concerned that you know, we are, you know, there's irrational exuberance in terms of the speed at which capital's coming into the market. And I mean, to unpick the two is really hard, which is why you have this constant talk about bubble, no bubble, and everybody's trying to pick the top of the market. You know, Bill Gurley comes out every month and says the top of the market. And at some point he'll be right. You know, I just don't know when. <laughs> could I ask, actually, could I ask the question now? What do you think, as an asset manager, do you think it is a bubble about to burst? Uh, I think our view is, I mean, we're big, quite big investors in technology. And I think our view is that it, it is unprecedented in terms of trying to understand the scale of um, you know, the user base that's out there. Particularly, you know, I think it's, we're not trying to get the, the brand element of it. You know, we're trying to get the enablers of technology. So it's not about Samsung or Apple. It's about the technology enablers, the, be the people that can benefit from the proliferation of mobile, of, of cloud, et cetera. You know, in the picks and shovels, you know, in the gold rush, it's not the, we're not looking for gold. We're, we're looking to sell picks and shovels. And, and those are the ones that, that we're investing in. And we think that, this, high, this kind of super cycle, we're, we're only partly, you know, very early stage through it, but there is this, you know, weird um, thing that there is just this ridiculous amount of capital chasing these ideas, which is historically typical of the top of a cycle. I think a lady here a question. Could you pass the mic on, please? Thanks. Hello. Um, Katie Parry from Social Media Compliance. That's probably a best question for Graham. Um, we've built a platform to proactively help anyone regulated by a financial service regulator. So mm -hmm. SEC, mm -hmm. they go on in the US, but FCA mm -hmm. primarily in the UK, be compliant proactively so they can prove compliance, which mm -hmm. of course in social media is imperative because yeah. there's going to be so many. The most dangerous thing that we foresee is the FCA's senior management regime, mm -hmm. which brings the burden of proof mm. changes it from the US perspective into the UK. What's your perspective on how that's going to affect the UK and will it have a knock-on effect on Europe subsequently? I'm, FCA is something I'm not that familiar with because I, I, what we work with more is around the sort of data privacy side of things. We work sort of at a deeper level of like safe harbor and, and how data privacy, so I'm probably not the best person to actually answer on specifics around FCA. So the, sorry, the question, I should be clear, yeah. sorry. Um, so one of the big multinational mm. banks has put a task force in place and they yeah. had to rewrite job descriptions because of the um, responsibilities all being on the CEO. So they've, that can't happen because yeah. it's just too much weight on one individual. Yeah. So therefore, data privacy is going to be taken away from possibly the CEO and put on maybe the compliance head or... Mm, somebody yeah. else. So I s will that influence the way that you're selling in Europe? Yeah, so I mean we are seeing, I mean, w you know, one of the things we do a lot of is so you have to nominate a data protection officer within the company that will be the person who's responsible. It's still, I mean, for any breaches, it still does fall on the, on the CEO's uh, 
head. I mean, it's still a very, very big responsibility, but it also falls on another person in a compliance role's head as well. Um, I think that the, um, you know, the, the, the size of the liability gets so huge now with, with these companies that the, um, you know, it almost becomes sort of, this is not practical. The, the size of liability is so huge, it's not practical. So it's about working with regulators to figure out how to create um, not just one person who's going to be responsible, but how do you actually prevent a problem in the first place? How do you create a sort of a burden of responsibility spread across the organization? And it's one of the things, we, we, we're an ISO compliant company, we comply with the, sort of the requirements for, for data privacy. And that requires every individual in the company to have a responsibility. And it's my role as a CEO to remind the entire company of the importance of this. From the person who asks the, the name of the person who comes into the building to make sure they've got a badge on, through to you know, making sure that our systems are safe and, and protected. And so I think what, what we're going to see more of is, is, is responsibility spread through the entire organization. But you know, it's still going to ultimately lie with, uh, with the CEO. And then maybe in the second row. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Dawid Konotia Huli. I'm uh, co CEO of a fintech social media uh, platform. My uh, question specifically is around your interaction with government and with some of the really big issues that they're grappling with. So, right now, I'm uh, fascinated by the idea of change and cultural shift. And how do you get an entire population to start saving? How do you get the entire nation to understand that it needs to take control of its finances? There's a whole bunch of major questions right now which the government's grappling with. And every time I talk to anyone in government or um, anyone in the corridors of power, they always say the same thing, which is, um, we've got some ideas, but we really, what we really need here is technology and innovation and effectively the sort of things, the sorts of minds that you guys have and the IP that's sitting, sitting up there. I just wondered, do you have any discussions at all around the really big social good uh, type issues that the government is grappling with? I mean, you've obviously done huge things in your own vertical channels, but to what extent are you collaborating or is, is that something that you think about but never actually happens in practice? So I'll maybe start the, so certainly from the, you know, software cybersecurity experience, it's been very positive. I mean, the government, the UK government specifically made cybersecurity a national imperative, you know, a number of years ago. And, and they've done a number of things to drive that out, both in business and, and with the consumers. So they run you know, campaigns along the lines of cyber streetwise. You may have seen some of the, the branding in London and other places, and also you know, really pushing out specifically to mid-market companies. And again, I think the government recognized, again, about three years ago, that the whole, the whole messaging and the whole thought process around cyber, I mean, people worried about, is the Chinese going to steal your data, which perhaps in some instances that's right. But, 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 but in the main, it's, it's a mass market issue for consumers, for mid-market companies, and it's a very, you know, you can fix it quite simply. So, so yes, so, you know, we've, we've had extensive dealings with the government, right the way up from GCHQ to working with other government organisations just to generally push, push message, branding, and even free products out. So, you know, I mean, our experience so far with the government around cyber and generally tech has been very positive. And again, and that was another factor that influences coming to the UK for the float. Carlo, did you want to jump in? There? Yeah, uh, basically, I, th I think that uh, we, we work a lot with the government, that's the answer. I think that we work with the government in several ways. First of all, we, lo we work very closely with the UK government. I'm, I'm now taking over two positions with the UK, within the UK government, basically working, for example, with the UK tech city, et cetera, or in the advisory panel, tech advisory panel. The task there, or the target there is, how can we create an environment for entrepreneurs? Right, where, because the government has very clearly uh, recognize that we can create new jobs. We have now almost 2,000 people now in the company. Uh, from, from 110 in back in 2011. So that's one area. The other area, we have a person which sits in Brussels, because in Brussels is where all the governments come together thinking of the, for example, the new digital directive. And so she works closely with, uh, with Brussels, with the, with the European uh, Commission, on how can we have a tech directive which is actually supportive of Europe, instead of blocking Europe from, from the future. Uh, and that's where we are doing a lot in terms of uh, working together with Brussels. And I think there's a lot more which can be done. Uh, and then I also work together with the Italian government, or with the Italian with parts of it at least, to see whether we can also create some positive, uh, um, basically, uh, environment, an environment friendly for, for entrepreneurs also there. What, on the Brussels side of things, sorry, sorry for, to jump into that. What, 
is it that you're after and what is it that they're after? And what are you trying to convince them they need to do more of? Uh, I'm not... Or well, is it more of a... Is it, is it more of I, think, I think it's all about the, the, the freedom of services. Uh, and, and this is also seen from a tech point of view. So topics there are data protection, topics there are uh, how do we uh, support European companies to become successful in Europe? Do we have to protect them against outside of Europe? Or, or, or how shall we best, best basically deal with it? And so they are working currently at uh, directives, so norms, new norms. And that's where I think it's, imp it's very important to work together with the companies themselves yeah. to make sure that these norms are supported rather than blocking. And are you speaking the same language? Are you talking past each other? Uh, yeah. I think we, we find a lot of openness okay. there. Uh, but then, of course, the devil is in the, in the detail when, when suddenly a concept or a philosophy then gets, becomes a norm. And, and, uh, and so I think that uh, that's where we have a, that is, that is a lot more work to be done there. And it's very early, I would say, still. So, sorry, um, Yeah, so three things. One is um, I've just spent six years on the governing board of Innovate UK, so looking at where government should be investing monies um, to encourage disruption and innovation in markets. And the answer to that generally just seems to be only in the spaces where market, markets won't do it by themselves. So, you know, if you have to build a large hadron collider, the market's not going to build that. So the government needs to build that. Um, having said that, government is spending a lot of money across catapult centres across the UK to just seed things happening. Um, the secondly, uh, in the rehabilitation of offenders, so people who don't want to be wearing our devices, um, where governments all over the world, and it's true here, are looking are being faced with the cost, the capital cost of building a new prison when they haven't got the money, and the cost of fifty pounds per night to keep somebody in prison, which achieves nothing. They uh, become um, more serious offenders. They become drug addicted, and they come out without any kind of rehabilitation back into society and reoffend. So, what are the alternatives to that? And technologies are now there, which provide a real alternative to that. And then, thirdly, in the social care sector, where we are providing technologies to enable people to live independently in their own homes, and government in that space is faced with uh, obviously huge problems, spiralling social care costs, um, and yet people who are not prepared to be responsible for their own health, their own health, and 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 ask government for help at that point. Um, and government, uh, in my view, is sort of going, ugh. We don't know how to deal with this, so let's let the market deal with it. And the, the way they do that is um, is to reduce the budgets through local authorities who would otherwise pay for it, so that a family will go to the local authority and say, we need the money for this to help granny, and the local authority say, sorry, we can't help you. You have to figure it out for yourself. So that family is left distraught, complains to the press, but goes and finds some way. And, and then going to find some way, that will encourage innovation, and, and companies will start to provide technologies in that space. One final quick question, very, very quickly. We've got about two and a half minutes, but this uh, lady here, please. Thank you. Um, my, name, my name's Sarah Washington. I work for UNICEF, the um, UN Children's Fund, and we work a lot with um, corporate partners and individual philanthropists as well as foundations to invest in um, supporting and empowering young people, particularly in markets like Africa and the BRIC countries, um, where we see a huge amount of consumer take up, particularly as Africa's got such a young population. So my question really is, perhaps, Sarah, you alluded earlier around what the market looks like, particularly in terms of the world market. Um, and I've just wondered what the challenges and opportunities are for investing in Africa and some of the BRIC countries, um, both from an investment point, but also in terms of consum consumerism as well. Um, well, I think if you were to look at where the growth is coming from, population growth, Africa is responsible for more than 50% of that over the next five to 10 years, uh, and some specific countries. So that obviously is going to create opportunity. Um, but secondly, you talked about average age of population, and the average age in Nigeria being 19, the average age in China being 33, um, and also the proportion of population who are actually employed and productive. If you look at that and you think demographics is a key in the investment cr uh, criteria, then you're going to be focusing on Africa. So um, I think we've seen a lot come out of Africa. We're getting quite excited about the future. I mean, it's sort of difficult for us sometimes to act in the local countries because we have no local knowledge. But I think Nigeria is poised for explosion. Uh, we backed a company called World Remit that helps worker remittances and do them at fees that are less egregious than, um, than Western Union. Um, I've seen companies that are starting um, cloud-based 
a banking system for small businesses to avoid you know, crooks effectively using paper records to take away your wealth. Um, and I think you are seeing these lightweight technology solutions that try and harness the basic problem, which is you're being predictive about water, uh, making sure you get access to your cash and not get mugged at the ATM, making sure you get your remittances back with low fees. And um, so they mix a social element with, with some very strong profit elements. And, and then again, including the next Brazil, which might be finally Nigeria, might be emerging as a force. So I think we're seeing stuff happen, and it's an exciting place to be. You do need local knowledge, though. Like, I wouldn't feel comfortable going to environments where I know nothing of culture. But I think there's a great opportunity emerging there. On which note, um, I'm going to close off the session with a little anecdote which reflects what Sarah said. The, one of the things that comes across is ambition, the change of attitude. And at the weekend, my 10-year-old son gave me some career advice, saying that I, too, should start a company. When I asked him what, he said, I don't know, just go make the future. And I guess uh, that leaves him in a pretty good place and reflects what some of these folks are doing. So please join me in thanking this very great panel.